If you have a pen and paper, you might want to get it out tonight, or your iPads, or I guess your phones. Normally I hate phones in church, but sure, tonight is cool because we should be writing a bunch of notes down. I feel like the Lord has blessed me. You know, what, what I'm about to impart uh, was given to me uh, by Pastor Anthony Mangan and his father, G.A. Mangan, who several of you know was an incredible man of the Lord, prayed the tabernacle prayer every day, and, and Pastor Mangan taught on it, and I studied it, what he taught, and began to do it. I did it. This is not to, this is just to give you a foundation of why I'm telling you what I tell you. I did it when I first received it 250 days in a row. And that was the time when God called me on the 40-day fast and all the other crazy things that shifted. This prayer uh, changed all that. And, and then recently I've been on it again for a long time. And if you'll get this tonight individually, your prayer life will never be the same again. If you pray 30 minutes a day and then you tap out and you, that's all you can get to and you're falling asleep, you will immediately be praying an hour and a half, hour, two hours probably every day without any kind of boredom. If you want your prayer life to go to levels it never has been to, you need this tonight. Again, it's not from me. It came to me. But if you will if you'll write as many notes down as you can and, and, and try to follow along in the Spirit, something will transform in your life tonight. And your prayer, your prayer life will transform tonight. So let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, and the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. Apologize for the voice. This is my fourth time speaking today, so I'm... I'm wiped out, praise God. But God's good, and we're going to have a great time tonight in the Holy Ghost. Cover your prayers, driving home tonight. Sounds like there's some rain going on outside. Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. Somebody say the pattern of the tabernacle pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Verse 5, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. So in other words, first of all, right there, the tabernacle is not an Old Testament pattern. This is a pattern in heaven that was ultimately made in the physical in the Old Testament. So this pattern is already in the heavens right now. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. And I want to talk to you tonight on the perfect pattern of prayer. The perfect pattern of prayer. Now I know it's the last night of the revival for me, and I know that on last nights of extended revivals, there's this pressure to blow it up and preach something that calls everyone to shout it down, and we lose our minds, and we think, what a, we had a great time. Then you forget what was preached 15 seconds after you leave the building. Okay? Tonight, I don't want that to happen. If, it's, if we shout, we shout. But I want you to leave with something tonight that you carry into your future and you look back and say, that revival, that last night, shifted how I think, how I pray, how I talk to God, 
and ultimately what I've received from God. So right now, let's begin to pray that before we start that God would open up our hearts and minds to be alert and to receive what he wants us to receive and to take us as far as we can go tonight in the spirit. God, open my mind, cause my mind to be alert, to speak and remember all the things according to this pattern of prayer that you've had me walk in. I pray in the name of the Lord that there would be a divine impartation tonight, not of me, but of you to the people. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would release something tonight into every home, every prayer life, and cause to be a transformation that takes everyone individually and GPC corporately to a deeper dimension in Jesus name would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time and let's go into this in the name of the Lord Amen. high five your neighbor and tell him I'm about to pray like I've never prayed you may be seated if you're tired of things not happening the way you want them to and you're praying and your prayers are not being answered, if you're praying and you're getting bored, if you're praying and you're not praying fervent prayers, if you're praying and you're falling asleep, if you're praying and nothing's happening and you feel God once in a while, uh, once a week, once every month, you need to get a hold of this tonight. God instructed Moses on how to build the tabernacle as it was in heaven, released in the earth. And Moses builds the tabernacle, and now we have it in the New Testament as a pattern also of prayer. G.A. Mang and the elder who's gone on to meet the Lord prayed this every day for, I forget how many years, I want to say 60 years, he prayed this every day, and it changed his world. The first thing he said about praying the tabernacle, you had to come to the gates with thanksgiving and praise. The first thing about your prayer life needs to be thanksgiving and praise every time that you pray. God is used to people that show up with their list, give me this, answer that, come through here, come through there, and never thank him for what he's done. But the Bible said enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So before I ask for anything, when I start to pray tomorrow morning, I want to get up and thank him for who he is, for what he's done, and praise him for what he's doing in my life. Are there any praisers in this building tonight? Now we had a mob of you that were up here shouting during the worship. Where are the real praisers at? There may not be any music, but I'm gonna worship God and praise the Lord anyway. Amen. Yes. And so when you went into the tabernacle, you would enter the gate, thanksgiving and praise. Now, first piece of furniture that you would encounter was the brazen altar of repentance. It was the largest piece of furniture inside the 45 foot long tabernacle, which was 15 foot wide, the tabernacle. This, this brazen altar of repentance is where the priest would bring the sacrifice, the lamb or the bullock or whatever the animal was and slay it before the Lord as a sacrifice of repentance. In other words, before you ever go into deep prayer, you must come to the altar of repentance. And it's the biggest piece of furniture for a reason. In fact, all of the other pieces of furniture in the tabernacle could fit inside of the altar of repentance because it should be the greatest place and the most important place of your prayer life every day is the altar of repentance before you talk to your wife before you talk to your boss before you talk to your friends and before you talk to your enemies we should all go to the altar of repentance every morning and ask God to kill the flesh inside of us now I just lost about half of you but repentance needs to happen daily now I'm gonna say this Here's how some of us repent. 
We get up in the morning, oh, Lord, thank you for this day. I repent of all my sins, in Jesus' name. Okay, God, can you take care of this, take care of that, take care of this? You've just killed no flesh. Because true repentance is soul-searching and digging for the things that you know and that I know are alive in your spirit or in my heart. Real repentance is, God, I'm not leaving this post until I've killed some flesh until some, some of me is burning on the altar, until my desires are dead and Josh dreams are dead and Josh issues and attitudes are on the altar. I cannot expect you to answer my prayers that I want to pray to you if I do not bring you an offering of repentance. In other words, when I get up, I've got to go before him and repent for anything possible that I can think of. And let me just say this, if you really get serious about it, you'll find a whole lot of things that you can repent about. Mm -hmm. And let me just say this also, Forgiveness is part of repentance. And you can repent of all the things in the world, but if you don't forgive the people that hurt you, your repentance is unfinished. We must repent and then forgive anyone. I know it's quiet. Anyone and everyone if we expect to have an encounter with God that morning. It's quiet must forgive must repent start looking what is where is flesh alive where am i struggling where do i have a bad attitude about this and here's how you can tell if there's someone that you need to forgive if 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 their name comes up and you get a ugh if the night before someone at dinner mentioned somebody's name and you started blasting them maybe not even vocally just in your mind the next morning when you get up to repent, that name ought to come to you. When you ask God, help me forgive people, that name of the one you were blasting in your mind ought to come to you and say, God, I forgive that person today. Help me kill that flesh, that resentment, that bitterness, that anger, that jealousy, whatever it is, even if it's vindicated, let me, let me please put that on the altar. And after the priest would kill the flesh, and J.A. Mangan would pray 30 minutes, they said, every day at the altar of repentance. Sometimes four hours a day. If G.A. Mangan had to repent four hours a day, <laughs> I need to repent a lot. <laughs> and so do you while you're laughing. <laughs> so then the priest would go to the laver of water and wash the blood in the brazen laver. You could see the reflection but when they would put their hands in the water full of blood, the blood would fill up the water, and you could no longer see your reflection because the blood blocked the reflection of your flesh. And the brazen laver was one of two instruments in the tabernacle that was not measured. And that laver of water was where they would wash the blood from the repentance off. The Bible said we are washed by the regeneration of the word of God. We are washed by the word of the Lord. So here's where you get your Bible out in the morning after you've just repented. And now you read to wash yourself. You read to wash the flesh off. You read to wash the sin off. You're not reading to be fed at this moment. You're reading to wash you out out of the way. If you don't know what to read, start reading in Psalms 51. That's the repentance chapter. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. I don't care what you read. Romans 6, Romans 7 are great chapters. Romans 10, Romans 12 are great chapters for repentance. And so when you begin to read these, this chapter or where chapters, when you're reading this, you are reading it to wash the flesh off. Does that make sense? You want the word to get in your mind because you don't want your mind to be conformed to the world you're about to enter into that day. But you want your mind to be transformed by the renewing so of the, so of the Holy Ghost. So when you read and your mind it starts to think of godly thoughts and Bible thoughts and spiritual thoughts versus carnal thoughts, fleshly thoughts, lustful thoughts, whatever it is, your mind is being washed before you enter into your day. 
And when they would wash that blood off, before they would go into the next room, the outer court, they would put on the inner court, they would put on the priestly garments. And on those priestly garments were bells and pomegranates at the base of the garments. The bells were ringing loud so that people outside the tabernacle could hear the priest were still alive. And the pomegranates were the fruits. This is a representation of the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit. The priest is about to go in and minister to the Lord for the people's sake. So you're about, ready? I want you to catch this if you catch nothing else. Before you pray for your yourself you need to pray for others even Jesus said when he taught them how to pray pray like this our father that'll preach right there he did say he said come to me unified don't come to me saying my father you belong to a body he said so you're going to bring the needs of others. That's why you've got the garments of the priesthood on. You're about to represent men to God and God to men in prayer. And the fruits and the gifts. You're praying this, God, let me walk in the fruits of the Spirit today. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. Let me walk in the fruits of the Spirit. Let the gifts of the Spirit be on me. If I need, if you want to use me, if someone needs a word from the Lord, let the gifts of the Spirit be on me today. Let me walk in the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit for other people that need a word from the Lord or peace in their life. Let me be a, a, a vessel that you can use for them. So, when the priests would do this, they would leave the outer court to go into the inner court. This word gets fun. And holding up the, 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 uh, the wall of, of inside the inner court was five posts. And it was like a veil that said it wasn't going to the Holy of Holies. And you would go through this, this curtain into the inner court, and there were five posts that held that up. Those five posts, Brother Mangan called wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The five attributes of God. And so before you go to the inner court, you go to each post. First post is wonderful. And you start to tell him how wonderful he is, how amazing he is. You thank him for your family. You thank him for your friends. You thank him for the Holy Ghost. You thank him for this beautiful church you go to. Thank him for your pastor and your pastor's family. You thank him for the covering that you have. You thank him for the ministry he's given you. I don't know, but you just go on and on. You can find a lot, by the way, to thank him for, for being wonderful to you. Is there anyone in here that knows he truly is wonderful to me in my life? The next post is counselor. This is where you ask God for counsel for the day. Vesta Mangan said, this is so powerful. She said, anything that you do not ask God to counsel you about for your day, hell has access to counsel you about for that day. Think about that. So this is where you start asking God, and you pray for others too who need counsel. Lord, who, give us direction. God, order my mind, order my steps, order what roads I take, which time I drive. Lord, order where, where I go, order whose hand I shake, order who calls me, who I call, who I text, who I sit by, who, what I, how I respond, my facial expressions, my reactions. You can go as deep as you want with the counselor to the point where now you're asking God to order the day. In other words, you're letting go of the steering wheel and you're saying, God, you drive the car. I cannot do it. I need your counsel. And if you'll do that, you'll find him directing you throughout the day, whispering stuff to you, telling you stuff, telling you, don't go this, go there. You ever heard God, you ever had God whisper something to you like, don't do this, don't get on that plane, don't go there, go, go left, don't go right? That, you know what? That's the counselor talking. He's whispering. He can guide you, the Bible said, with his eye. But if you don't want him to be your counselor, you'll guide yourself with your own eye. 
The word said we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So if I have faith in him, I'm trusting him to guide my family, guide my heart, guide my mind, guide my spirit. Counsel me about everything. Counsel my wife today. Counsel my kids when they go to the school. Counsel who they talk to. Counsel this. Counsel, counsel the teachers teaching my kids. I don't care where you go with it, but you pray, God, let the counselor be in my house, be in my family, be at my church, be at my body boss's house counsel the people then he's the mighty god he's the mighty god here's where you start to pray and thank him for his oneness for all that he is and this is where you start to wage war against the enemies you start to pray against any spirit that would rise up against the mighty God. Any spirit that would rise up against truth. Any spirit that would rise up against the oneness that you believe. Here's where I pray against Islam. You can say amen. You're apostolics. Thank you, six of you. Here's where you pray against any spirit. Hinduism, Buddhism, atheism. I pray against any cult to, to stay out of the church right here. I pray against any cult out there in the world, any movement out there, any lifestyle that wants to get into the church and destroy the church from within. You, oh, I feel like I'm hitting a spirit right now in here. Listen, we've got to stop being intimidated to pray imprecatory prayers. Those are prayers that are against the enemies of God. In other words, I, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin, and I'm not going to sit there and let the sin get into my house, get into my family, get into my church, because I want to be a silent ostrich and put my head in the sand and never war against the enemies of righteousness and the enemies of holiness. Where are the shouters at now? And the enemies of what God calls pure. Any satanic spirit that would exalt itself against the kingdom of God, I pray you bring it down. Maybe you've got spirits at work at your, in your house, at your job, in the church. I don't know. You can wage war right here. You serve the mighty God. You serve the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God. He has all power. There's no one like you, Lord. Lord, you can bring down anything that would rise up against the church, against people in the church. Here you can pray for your friends right now. God, if there's a spirit attacking my friend, attacking my loved one, I pray against it right now. You're the mighty God. Let truth arise. Let the word of God arise. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. That's what the Bible says. By the way, you will get a breakthrough every time you pray the tabernacle. More than one, usually. A lot of times I have to stop the breakthrough to continue. Because sometimes I'll get a breakthrough at Counselor or Mighty God or the altar of pen and know I've got to continue. The most amazing thing about that, the tabernacle prayer is you can't stop. You want to stop and go, but it's like, I've got to finish it. I'm halfway through it. I might have to do it during my, during my break, but I've got to finish this. It keeps you praying till you get a spirit of prayer where you walk in prayer. The next post, so you've got wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. This is, this is where it's really easy to break through, really easy. Those of you that do this, I heard someone say, they know this, right, because here's why. Here's where you pray for the broken for the weak, for the forgotten, handicapped, homeless, homebound, the incarcerated, the institutionalized, the orphans, the foster children. Oh, I'm finding some of you like, what, we can pray about? Yeah, you can pray about this every day. Widows, widowers. There are three, uh, Brother Becton mentioned this at the men's conference, Pastor Zuniga, there are 300,000 homeless kids right now in Guatemala City. Who's praying for them every day? 300,000 living in the dump, living on the streets. 
when he mentioned that, every day. Since that day when he's mentioned that at that men's conference, every day. Every day I'm praying, God, give them food. God, give them shelter. I pray, I pray until I know something's released. I pray so hard until I know. Because I don't want to say, oh, God, get into and like move on with, with my life. Listen, someone's got to catch a burden for other people if you want God to answer prayers that you need him to answer in your own house. Here's where you pray for the sick, the wounded, the nobodies. You pray for anything, and you can get specific or you can be general. There's some days you can just name it, Lord, all the orphans or all the widows. But there's people that you know that might be widows. There's people that you know that might be incarcerated. There's people that you know that might be in an insane asylum. And you might, you might have people that in your life that you know are in this category. And guess what? That's your moment every day. You will not forget their name ever again. You've got family members, some of you that, that fit the role here, and, and they're hurting, and, and you can hit that every day in prayer. You're the everlasting Father. And I tell them like this, I say, you, you care about the ones no one cares about. You see the You see the ones nobody sees. You know about the guy right now in the rain out there that soaked the lady. I passed by a man today on the road that was homeless with a sign out. He had to have been 80 years old with a cane, 80 or, or older. And I thought, oh, my word. I pray for these kind of people every day. He's out there in the rain walking with a cane at 80 years old holding a sign. I'm going to let it hit until you get it in your spirit. Your prayer life does not need to be boring. It's just that it's boring because all some people know how to pray about is themselves. That's why you're bored because God's left and lets you get bored until you get a burden for others. Everlasting Father. And you go and you can get a breakthrough real, real easy here. Brother Haley, you can get a breakthrough. And then... Because if, you, if, you, if you're human, you'll start to feel the pain of some of these things you're praying for. He's the Prince of Peace. Here's where I pray for Israel every day. The Bible said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You pray for Israel to have peace, God will bless you with peace. Every day you should pray for Israel. Israel, every day you should partner with them in prayer. Every day, God, give Israel peace. Give Jerusalem peace. Give it, give it peace in their borders, peace in their cities, peace in their towns, peace in their government, peace in, in every alley, in every neighborhood. And then I pray for America. Gosh, Give America peace. This is the stuff Daniel did, everybody. He was praying for his nation like this every day. You got to pray for your nation. Dear God, help us. We complain and act like we know everything politically, and we never pray for our nation. We know everything on every political radio station. We know every person running in the debates and haven't prayed for one thing to happen. The church has to pray. My Lord, there's shootings everywhere. Someone needs to pray, God, send peace to the cities tonight. Send peace to Nashville. Send peace to Chicago. Send peace to Los Angeles. Send peace to wherever. Just peace. Peace. And you pray peace on the nations of the world if you want to. And you can pray in different places. And you pray peace in the church. Peace on my pastor. Peace on his family. Peace for his children today. What would happen in your house if you prayed for your pastor's house every day to have peace? I'll tell you what would happen. The anointing flows down. The peace you pray to them will come back to you in your own house. You want peace in your family? Pray for your pastor and his family to have peace, and the peace will roll back into your house. I just gave you a word right there. If you want peace in your house, pray for your covering to have peace, and the peace will flow back to you. Peace in the church, peace in the body, peace in GPC. Let people that have, have division become unified. Let there be peace between others, God. Give us peace in our family, peace for my wife, peace for my children. And you pray because he's the prince of peace. And then you go into the inner court. Now, right there, your prayer life should be already going to another level. But we are just getting started. Because the next piece of furniture in the inner court is the candlestick. When the priest would burn that altar, uh, that, that sacrifice in the altar of repentance, take the, the, they would trim the wicks of the candlestick when they went in, and they would put oil, pure oil, in that candlestick. Seven, 
and they would pour it in there, and then they would light the wicks, and the candlestick would light up the inner court. The oil, the fire of the candlestick is a representation of the Holy Ghost that brings light, brings illumination, brings revelation. Here's where you pray for God to refill you again today with the Holy Ghost. God, consume me like a fire. Put Pour fresh oil into me today. Let me see the way you want me to see. Let me reflect you. Let you, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Let people see you and not me when I go to work today, when I go to the school today. Let them see you and not me. Lead the way. Light up my path. Thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. I pray, God, you let me see with the eyes of the spirit and not the eyes of the flesh let me walk in the light you can get a breakthrough right there by the way as there's been so many times where I started to pray that and the Holy Ghost would just rush me and consume me I would begin to speak in tongues because the Lord wants you to want him to consume you every day of your life I'll move on. You go past the candlestick. And the next piece of furniture is the table of showbread. By the way, all the pieces in the tabernacle were in the shape of a cross. The next piece of furniture is the table of showbread, which was a table and some bread on top of the table. This is where Brother Mangan said that his dad would pray for two things. The bread's the word of the Lord. He said you would pray for the table, which is the people that hold up the bread. Here's where you pray for the ministry. You pray for every preacher, every pastor, every missionary, every evangelist. Sometimes you'll be general, sometimes you'll be specific, and names will come to you. God, people that are preaching the truth. People pass them. Sometimes you'll be praying, and all of a sudden, boom, golly, somebody in Wisconsin needs, needs prayer. Somebody in Africa needs prayer. Somebody in India needs help right now. And you're praying that whoever's, whoever's holding up the word, whoever's standing out, reaching out, reaching for the world, that you would bless them. You would sustain them, protect their families, strengthen their home. Here's another great spot to pray for your pastor, by the way. Here's another great spot to pray for your leadership when you begin to pray, God, those that are holding up the word that I feed off every Sunday. Those that are studying to hear from you from my situation that I'm in that I can't fix. God, feed them. Strengthen them. Sustain them. Give them a word today. And then... The, word, the bread is the word. So guess what? You get your Bible back out because Bible reading is part of prayer. Now, some of you don't believe that but because you think prayer is you just talking to God like Santa, and when you're done, you get off his lap and you're, you're done. But prayer is you talking to God and God talking back to you. Or God talking to you and you talking back to God. And sometimes we don't get a chance to get God's opinion on something because we pray and then we leave and we never open up his word to hear his voice. Here's where you read to be fed. You read until a verse jumps out at you. I don't care if you've got to read 10 minutes, 20 minutes. You read until something jumps off the pages and you know that's food for me. That's strength for me. Oh, I feel joy right there. I'm going to be all right today. It's going to be okay. God's going to carry me. You might have no idea. The verse will just leap off the page at you. I was reading the other day and I was, I've been praying, God, I'm sacrificing my guts out for the kingdom of God. I drive everywhere and take my family. I'm thankful to do it. And I'm exhausted and I'm, I was going on and on and on and then I get to the, and I'm praying about it and then I start the tabernacle <laughs> and I get going through the tabernacle and I'm praying for everybody else and I get to the table of showbread and I'm in like chronicles <laughs> and it says like don't let your hands be weak for your work shall be rewarded and it just jumped off at the pages at me because he was letting me know Here's how you know it's for you. When it just jumps at you, even though you know it's not specifically naming you and the situation, the word is alive. It will leap off the page, and you know God's talking to me about that thing right there. So I have confidence that that's going to be all right because the word just strengthened. So you read the Bible for food. Job said that he wanted the words of God more than his necessary food. Esteem the words of God more than it's necessary food. Next post, 
Next piece of furniture was the altar of incense. Oh, man. Here's where you start intercession. Here's where you weep for your family. Here's where you bring up your lost loved ones. Here's where you worship God. They would, uh, the priest would put four ingredients when he mixed the apothecary. Annika, stacti, galbanum, and frankincense. One of them came from the resin of a tree when, when, when the tree was broken. One of those ingredients came from the depths of the Red Sea at the bottom of the sea where the seaweed was. One of them came from a tree early in the year. And one of them came all year long. The resin, the last one came all year long. And they would take those four ingredients ingredients and they would mix them and put them on the altar of incense to offer a sweet smelling savor unto God. In other words, one came from something broken. One came from something deep. One came from something early and one came all the time. And right here's where you give God broken, deep, early morning, anytime, anywhere worship. No matter what I'm going through, God, I will give you the best part of me, the broken part of me, the deep part of me. Early, David said, will I seek thee? I search for thee. I want you all the time. And you give God deep prayer. You offer him a sweet smelling savor. Here's where you take off all the accolades, all the titles. I'm nothing without you. People might think I'm something, but I'm nothing. I know the real me. I know the real struggles and the real issues that I have. And everyone can, you can put on a suit, put on a dress, and people think you're powerful. But let me tell you, everybody in this building is human. We've all made mistakes. We've all got issues. And we need to be real when we're in front of God. You can act one way up here, but when you're in your prayer closet, don't you be coming to God acting all stuck up like, Lord, you're blessed to have me talk to you. No, I'm blessed to be breathing right now. Let me just open up my mouth and say, God, I don't deserve it, but I love you and I need you and I worship. Notice, we're not in the Holy of Holies yet. And notice, I've still not brought up my list yet. You want your prayer life to go farther. Here's how you do it. Praying kingdom prayers. And so then the priest would go to the veil after he had taken off that priestly garment with the bells and the fruits, and he's just standing there before God in the white robe, and he's just giving God the raw worship. And the veil, which you know Calvary tore the veil, when Jesus died, the veil was torn, giving you and I access into the Holy of Holies. The place where only the priests were allowed to go before the high priest. Now you and I are allowed to go in prayer every day. And here's the veil. So here's right here. I thank the Lord for Calvary. I thank him for everything he did when he walked this earth. I thank him for every miracle, every principle he taught, every parable he taught, every blind eye he healed. I'm, I praise God for, for Bartimaeus still today. That sounds crazy, but it's not really crazy. If I praise him for what he did before, I can expect him to do it again now. And so I thank him for everything he did. I thank him for the nails. I thank him for the crown of thorns. I thank him for taking stripes on his back. I thank him that he did something to get me access to where I can bring the needs that I have to him and actually see them answer. You want prayers answered, here's how you do it. And they would, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And then that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of it was the mercy seat. Mercy seat, the next place you go. Oh, no devils here. No spiritual warfare here. No fighting the enemy here. It's just you and the Lord. When you go past the veil, you go past your flesh to start praying things you wanted to pray an hour ago, 30 minutes ago, two hours ago. But guess what? You've prayed the pattern that God wants you to pray. You've prayed for the things he wants to answer. You've prayed for the people he's looking out for, and no one's praying for them. So now you tap into a place where it's just you and him. He tobo shakatalahaya. See, we get it backwards. We think we should start in the Holy of Holies and, and tell them all the stuff we need. Then if we get to the other people, we get to them. But that's not how it works. And that's why your prayers don't get answered. But when you do it this way, I can tell you, I'm not trying to take a break from this, but I can tell you there's been so many times where prayers get answered in my life. 
One time I prayed the tabernacle prayer. Pastor Zuniga, I've been doing it every, every day for a while. And in one day, six things, big things that I needed God to do all happened in one day. Six answered prayers all over the nation in one day because he heard me in that tabernacle praying unto him. So the mercy seat is where you start thanking him for mercy. I pray God give me mercy when it matters and mercy where it matters. I pray mercy on my kids. I pray mercy on my wife. I pray mercy on our souls. I plead, because they put the priest would put the blood on that mercy seat. Here's where you plead the blood, right here, okay? Here's where you start going to war and praying. God, I plead the blood for my family. I pray for mercy for my kids. If your kids are lost right here, you pray for mercy. I declare mercy where there could be wrath. I declare mercy where there could be judgment, where there could be a car wreck. I speak peace right now. I speak the mercy of God over my family. I speak the mercy of God over over my mind and right now you plead the blood everything I repented for earlier God I pray for mercy on it now I plead your blood over everything I put on the altar everything I repented for this morning I plead your blood over it right now and after you're done with the mercy seat you can break through there too I mean all these places you can break through I'm just giving I'm being very transparent with you tonight this is where I live the next thing you do Inside the Ark of the Covenant was three things. Ten Commandments, pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded. This is where it gets fun. The Ten Commandments was the law. It's covered up by the mercy seat. Here's where I pray. I pray I submit myself to the commandments of God. I submit myself to the word of God. I want you to get this right here. I submit myself to the elders in my life, the pastor in my life. I submit myself. You say it out loud every day. You want, you want victory over a rebellion or victory over an attitude that won't be submitted? Pray this every day. God, I submit myself to the word of God. I submit myself to my pastor. I submit myself to my authority. I submit myself to the commandments in the Bible. Wherever is there, God, I pray that you'll protect me if I'm submitted to the commandments of your word. Now, after you've done all that stuff God's way, you grab the pot of manna, which was daily provision. Now you ask God for the stuff you need him to do. Boy, now you start to say, God, take care of this bill. Take care of this situation. God, you know, you know this family and the church needs that to happen. You know they, that prayer request, they need this to come through. God, I speak it right now in the name. You don't ask him, God. You start declaring it. You've, you've prayed the kingdom prayers. You're in the holy of holies. You declare it. You prophesy it. You speak it. This person shall be blessed in Jesus' name. I can't tell you how many people I pray for right here that will call me weeks later, months later, and say, man, you're not going to believe how God's blessing my finances. And, I would say, and I'll say in my mind, yeah, I would. I name you every day at the pot of manna, and I pray for your finances every day. And God will bless them. And ready for this? Aaron's rod, the rod that budded, shouldn't have had buds on it, but it started budding even though it was a, a dead stick. Miracles. Hilo shakataya. Here's where you start to speak miracles over sicknesses and situations you cannot fix on your own. You start to say, by the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of Jesus, I command this person to be healed today in Jesus' name. I speak a miracle to that family. They're going to come out of that trial. That kid's going to pray through. That situation at my job is going to be fixed in the name of the Lord. And you start to walk in the spirit of authority. And you pray for whatever miracles you need God to do. And you'll start to see answers heap up. And ready? When they would leave the tabernacle, there were angels embroidered in the, in the curtain. And he said, when you leave the tabernacle, that's where you pray for angels to be with you in the day. Angels with your kids. Angels at your home, around your vehicle. They can show you the picture. This week, my wife took it to our kids at school. And she took four pictures, and one, two, looks normal, but all of a sudden, the last two, they're being circled by this. In the, in the, in, it showed up on the picture on the phone. She couldn't see it in, rea in real life. It shows up on the phone. 
like a, like a circle around our children, embracing them. The word says this, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. The word encampeth means to bend down as in a circle. But guess what? Every morning, every morning, we're praying, God, <laughs> let your angels be with them at the school today. And it, may, it may sound silly to you, but you haven't been in the tabernacle with me praying for God to do that very thing and to see that literally answered. It took all the fear away, took all the worry. We just moved to that town. We haven't been there a month. We don't know anybody there. But we know one thing. There are angels on site with our children every morning because we're praying. For Stand to your feet right now. When I started doing that, my prayer life went through the roof, and so were yours. That's not... That's not I mean, it's not my idea. If I was, I'm not trying to brag on me. I'm telling you, it was given to me. And I have an obligation to give it to you. And I've preached here, I don't know, six years, five years, and wanted to release it. Every revival I've come here, I wanted to release that. Everyone. And every time, he would say, not yet. They're not ready. But this week, he said, Sunday night, they're ready. They're ready. And they'll walk in it. And they'll go deeper. And then he said this, and I will answer their prayers. I don't know what that means to you. I don't know what you're praying. But if you've got a need, I'd start thanking God right now because you're about to see answers. You're about to see God answer things that you've been waiting in frustration over, waiting, saying, God, where are you? Don't you hear me? Yes, he hears you, but you've got to get in the right pattern. God's a God of principle. You can't just show up and demand, give me this God. No, you do things his way, and he'll blow your mind with what he can do in your life by just being submitted to the process of prayer. If you want to walk in this, would you come to the altar right now? I'm getting ready to get in the car and drive home, but I want to pray an impartation on you right now before I leave. Would you get up here right now if you want to walk in this prayer? You, have, you might have to watch it again. If you want to go to the, uh, Brother Mangan's bookstore, he's got a DVD set at their White Steeple bookstore in Alexandria where you can watch the DVDs where he teaches all this. It's nine, it's nine DVDs that I just gave you in 45 minutes or whatever it's been. So what you do is this. You pray for the Lord to let you walk in this. I'll say this to you. Please hear this. The only times I'm frustrated in the tabernacle is when I don't do it early. If I do it throughout the day, because I, I, I made a commitment to God, I'm going to do it. If I have to do it at 10 o'clock at night, driving in the car, I do it. I do it. There are days where I, I just get it, I do it to get it done. Some days, you'll do it in 30 minutes. Some days, it'll take you three hours. But I notice something. Please catch this. If you get it going early in the morning, you'll see answers. You'll see answers usually that day. You'll see answers. There's a little guy, man, there's a little guy in a hospital in Gainesville. My wife showed me a picture on my phone, on her phone, like three months ago, of a little baby. And the mom is begging, his name is Max, begging for anyone to pray for Max to have a heart transplant. It's the cutest little baby. And the Lord said, Tabernacle. He said, yes, sir. Sometimes they pray about something once. Sometimes it's a memorial. God says, bring it to me every day. So every day, I get up, and that tabernacle, I pray for little Max. And we've been so busy driving and traveling. It's been, I've been trying to get the tabernacle. But last week, I was up early. Short quick time. I, up I said, God, this kid's not going to make it much longer. It's real yellow and pale, and we've got to have an answer. And that, later that day, the wife, the lady post, Janae showed it to me. Guess what, everybody? Max is in surgery right now getting his heart transplant. 
and he survived it, and he's doing great. Now that may patty cake you. I prayed for that kid every day. That's an answered prayer to me. That's God hearing me. I can give you example after example after example. Some people I know, people I don't know. You want answered prayers, then start praying for other people. And it'll build your faith for your own prayers because you realize, wow, God wants to answer prayers. I've just been focusing on me too much. But when you focus on others and you see him answer the prayers for others, it builds your faith to bring your needs to him because you know he heard me pray for that lady. He heard me pray for that man. He heard me pray for that situation. And he's listening to me. My brother, my brother lives in Alaska, works on the North Slope, and he, and he was making, like, I'm just being transparent, for like $42 an hour, doing good. But then they, they shifted his hours and said, you've got to work on the slope four weeks and be home two weeks. And he called me and said, Josh, and today's his birthday. He said, Josh, he said, that can't be God's will. I, I remember seeing my wife, and it's, it's an attack on our marriage. It's just frustrating. And I, I, and I said, bro, it's okay. I'm going to take you to the tabernacle. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just going to take you to the tabernacle. And every day at the pot of manna, I'd say, God, you got to take care of my brother. My brother, he needs a financial breakthrough. In his, he needs the job in, in Alaska that's closer to home. And I know you can do something. He called me a week later. He said, Josh, I got an interview Monday. He got a job five minutes from his house. $47 an hour. Full time. All we, and, is, can, and can make every church service. That's cute. No, no, no. That's the tabernacle. That's saying, God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do it your way, God. I can tell you stories all night long. You don't need more stories. You're ready. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hands? I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody in this room, I don't know if I've preached to one person, but that there's somebody in this room that as of right now have just tapped into a prayer life that will never be the same again. I speak divine encounters, daily breakthroughs, daily words from you to speak to them. I speak in the name of Jesus, answered prayers, miracles out of nowhere, financial provision, answers on their job, answers in their marriage, answers in their loneliness. And by the authority of the word of God and the power that's in the name of Jesus, I seal this right now in the Holy Ghost and I command in Jesus' name that this church would walk in deeper prayer. As of right now, would you lift up your voice and would you shout unto God right now and receive this in Jesus' name. Get ready. He'll call you to fasting. He'll call you to deep places. Get ready. Angels will come visit you in your dreams. You'll have encounters with God you've never had in your life. He'll whisper to you things in the middle of the night. You can pray longer than you think. You can pray deeper than you think. You can go farther. Remember when he told the disciples, just come a little bit, he went a little bit farther. He said, can you pray with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And when they went out there and fell asleep, it said he went a little farther. God, help us to learn the art of lingering in the spirit. 
Help us to learn how to pray and wait on the Lord. Help us to learn to read our Bibles until he talks to us. Help us to learn to pray the kingdom prayers, to pray for our covering, to repent every day. Help me get into the Holy of Holies every day where the glory of God is. This morning, I could feel it when they were talking about, I'm running, I'm running into the, and I can see the glory as I run into the throne room. I, I couldn't wait to preach this tonight because I could feel the Lord saying, that's what happens when you run into the throne. When you finally get into the Holy of Holies, you can ask me anything. You can speak anything. God's going to back you up when you show him, I'm praying for Israel. I'm praying for the broken people. I'm praying for the sick people. I'm praying for the widows. I'm praying for the orphans. I'm praying for those kids in Guatemala. Whatever, whatever comes to your mind. I pray right now as I get ready to depart that a burden would get on you to go deep in prayer in Jesus' name. In G this church is entering harvest. You're entering great seasons of revival. It's time to go deeper. Create a culture that's so strong in prayer that God can bring the harvest in greater amounts to you because you've got such a strength in corporate prayer that he can trust you with greater results with more people because there's such a base of prayer. The largest churches in our movement, the, the, the three or four that stand out above everyone that are much larger, they all have one thing in common. They pray all the time. They pray all the time. They have 24-hour prayer going at their church all the time. They have prayer going all the time. If you're at CLC in Stockton, there's people praying in that West Lane campus 24 hours a day. Isn't that right, Brother Larson? They're praying all the time. If you're in Alexandria, there's someone praying in that prayer room 24 hours a day. They just walk in prayer. And guess what? God gives them the biggest harvest. I felt throughout this revival to keep releasing threads of prayer to you. Glory climb. This one talking about the, 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 when the lame leap, when we get that place of prayer where it's about everybody in the kingdom, getting the kingdom, enlarging the kingdom, get the kingdom bigger, increase God. I'll decrease. You increase. Increase God. Increase God. When that base hits this church, this church will erupt in growth that cannot be contained in this room. I'm telling you right now, we had three get the Holy Ghost in Ashland City. A total of eight after, after the baptisms were over. Eight received the Holy Ghost today. Eleven were baptized. Last week, 27 got the Holy Ghost. You've had, you've had 38 people in the last week get the Holy Ghost. God's trying to tell you something. I want to give you something great. Will you build the foundation of prayer big enough for them all to fit in? My job is done here. I can feel a release. But listen, you might have to, you might have to go over some things. You know, you're not going to get it perfect. I don't get it perfect. But just try to walk in it. And guess what? This is what's so cool about it. When you're done with it in the morning, maybe it's an hour, you've got all day long to pray stuff that you want to pray. Now at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you say, God, I need you to fix this. That lady's crazy. She's messing. And she's going, I need you to stop that right now. Versus that being your first prayer of the day. You've been in the Holy of Holies before you met any human. Walk in it in Jesus' name and see what God does for you. I love everybody. I love you all.